All right, I'd like you to take your Bibles tonight, if you will, and turn to the book of 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 21, 1 Samuel chapter 21. I had to pick an adjective to describe everything that I see going on around me uh, in the last probably two years or so, especially since COVID and uh, everything that's been going on politically and things like that with the economy, uh, would be desperation. I see a lot of people in desperation mode. Uh, as you watch TV, uh, I, I was watching a debate last night, caught the tail end of a debate in Pennsylvania, and desperation. And, and as I read, I look at the polls and different things, and it's desperation. And uh, people in the grocery store, I was in the grocery store just a couple of days ago, and, and uh, I was looking for something, and they didn't even have it. I was very surprised. And then I heard another man complaining, and it was like desperation. They were like, look at this. Uh, the you know, shelves aren't stocked, and things you used to could get so easy, and it's not there anymore. And so, you know, people are getting desperate. People, uh, if you go to the, I don't know how many people live up towards Salisbury. If you, if you go to the Sheets gas station up there, it's, it's a madhouse. I mean, uh, I was getting diesel, and, and there were trucks in front of me that I had to wait behind, and, uh, you know, four and five cars, you know, waiting at a pump and everything, trying to get that extra one or two cent, which makes a big deal. And so people are getting desperate. And uh, so I was praying, and I was asking God to show me what he wanted uh, me to preach, and I've been studying a lot over the last two weeks on the life of David. And uh, I believe this will help you tonight. I actually, uh, I was fortunate enough to preach this before, about an hour and a half ago on the radio. And uh, so I'm going to preach it to you tonight, and uh, I believe that this will help you. Um, if I had to describe David to you tonight, I would first off describe him as a runt. You say, what do you mean? He's, he was a king. Well, he was a runt first. Uh, David was the one little boy that uh, probably got in the way. He was a little boy that, uh, you know, when his parents were around and they were having people over or whatever, or they were trying to build something or working on whatever at the home or, you know, outside, he was the one that would always say, well, go find something to do, won't you go play? And, and so they wanted to find something that could occupy David, so what do they do? They give him a job, and his job was doing what? It was tending sheep. And so this runt is now... Uh, a little boy out in a, out in a field, uh, day and night, tending the sheep. Let me tell you something about David. David was the eighth son, all right? Most people may not realize that, but he was, he was one of eight children. Uh, God sees more than we do. And so if you were to, if you didn't know the end of David's life, and you look back, you have a runt, he's the, he's the eighth son, he's the youngest, uh, he's, a, you know, he's tending the sheep, he's kind of just kind of put out to get out of the way. You wouldn't think a whole lot about David. You wouldn't think that this man or this boy would end up becoming a king and all the twists and turns of his life. But this was a man that God would say is a man after his own heart. So David uh, is a very important person that we find in the Word of God that was probably never picked to do anything with his life. Uh, when you think about him, I think of David being really clean and squeaky and righteous. I mean, as he was growing from boyhood to manhood, uh, there was something about him. He always seemed to do the right thing, and he was always in the right place and things like that. And this message that I'm going to preach tonight is probably going to spin the heads off of religious, denominational, straining gnat, crowd who likes to disqualify people uh, that is a threat to their ego or their standing in the brotherhood of the stick -neck Baptist. Now, I made sure I said that twice on the radio. Uh, there are a lot of people that are not pulling for you today. There's a lot of people that will look at your life and say that you, uh, your steel in your Christian life will never amount to anything for God. But I want us to examine David's life. And I I want to ask you tonight, are you ready for a story, boys and girls? Because we're going to get started here. Isaiah chapter number 21, verse number 1. Then came David to Nob, to Ahimelech, the priest. And Ahimelech was afraid of the meeting of David, and said unto him, Why art thou alone, and no man with thee? And David said unto Ahimelech, the priest, The king hath commanded me a business, and hath said unto me, Let no man know anything of the business whereabout I send thee, and what I have commanded thee. And I have appointed my servants to such and such a place. Now therefore, what is under thine hand? Give me five loaves of bread in mine hand, or what there is present. And the priest answered David and said, There is no common bread under my hand, but there is hallowed bread. 
if the men have kept themselves at least from women. And David answered the priest and said unto him, Of a truth women have been kept from us about these three days. Since I came out, the vessels of the young men are holy. And the bread is in a manner common, yea, though it were sanctified the day in the vessel. Verse number 6. So the priest gave him hallowed bread, for there was no bread there but the showbread, which was taken from before the Lord, to put hot bread in the day when it was taken away. Now a certain man of the servants of Saul was there that day, detained before the Lord, and his name was Doeg, an Edomite, the chiefest of the herdsmen that belonged to Saul. And David said unto Ahimelech, And is there not here under thy hand spear or sword? For I have neither brought my sword nor my weapons with me, because the king's business required haste. And the priest said, The sword of Goliath the Philistine, whom thou slewest in the valley of Elah, behold, it is here wrapped in a cloth before the ephod. If thou wilt take that, take it, for there is no other save that here. And David said, There is none like that, give it me. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for the reading of your word. I pray, God, that you would take it, Lord, and Lord, that you would just stitch it in our hearts tonight. God, if there's one here tonight, Lord, that this message, Lord, Lord, knocks on a heart's door, taps on a toe, Father, I pray, God, you would move them tonight. Father, I pray, God, that they would seek uh, the shelter in you, Lord, that can only be found, uh, Lord, uh, in your presence. And I pray, Father, Lord, that uh, you would help us tonight to learn. Lord, I pray, God, that this message, Father, Lord, would speak to us, Lord, like none other. God, I pray it be an encouragement. But, Father, I pray, Lord, tonight, Lord, that we would kind of reroute our way of thinking. And, Lord, we would look at this message in a different light than actually what we're reading And Father, Lord, there's a message here to be heard by your people tonight and one to be preached. And Father, we're going to love you and bless you and thank you for all you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This message tonight is a message of desperation. Uh, David was on the... Now, here is David, a man after God's own heart. A man that walked out as a boy on a battlefield with all of his brothers who were crying and huddled over and were scared... Uh, they were uh, uh, they were they were distraught, uh, and he walks up and he picks up these stones, and he goes and he faces a giant, and he says, "The battle's not mine." He says, "The Lord will go before me. I'm giving this battle to God, and we know how it turns out." This is the man of great faith. This this man here also uh, was uh, was uh, he turned down the uh, the king's sword and the king's armor. Saul's, okay? Uh, This man traveled lightly, all right? He knew in whom he believed. He trusted the Lord. But yet we find him in a church and he's asking, uh, he's, first of all, he's looking over his shoulder. He's on the run and he's scared. And he doesn't have sustenance. He's looking for food and he's looking for shelter and he's looking for protection. This is David. This is the future king that we see here, and all of a sudden we don't see him in the light that we saw him before. And so this is desperation, David. And tonight I want to talk to you about this man. He is now wanted by the king. Why was King Saul after David? I mean, remember, David did what? David played for the king. All right, David. David was very involved with the king, and and there was respect there. And but all, all of a sudden now, King Saul is looking to end his life. Six times he tried to kill David and was unsuccessful. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But why was the king after David? Well, the reason he was after was jealousy will do a lot of things. Jealousy will burn in your heart. And and King Saul knew that David was the up and coming, and and so. David was a threat to everything that Saul had and Saul was. But can I tell you something? Saul was not always that kind of man. Saul was actually an upright man when he took the throne. When Samuel uh, uh, went and appointed Saul to be king, uh, he was respected. All right, and, 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 But there were some things that changed in Saul's life. So now we know that David's on the run. He's wanted by King Saul. His face is all over the news. He's... If you go in the post office, you probably see David's face hanging on the wall. Have you seen this man? He's probably on Israel's most wanted uh, television show, if you will. So everybody knows that Saul is looking for David. David has nowhere to go. Everybody knows him. He's looking for shelter. And, And the whole time he's moving around, he's having to look behind him. Because he knows, obviously, that the king hates him. And the king wants to do away with him. Now, think about this. 
But just a few years before that, David was just tending sheep. David had a simple life. Everything was okay. He had his brothers, he had his family. Things were going good for him. And then all of a sudden, he gains notoriety when he takes the head off of a giant. So, right after he does that, he winds up serenading the king. David seemed like everything was going all right in his life. But now all of a sudden, we see the future king running for his life. And so, here we have the run of the litter, Jesse's littlest son, now appearing as a King Arthur, most of you know that story, if you will, to Israel. He's handsome, and he's very humble. Nobody would expect this from him. The Bible tells us that Jonathan loved him, Mishael married him, but the king hated him. Man, what a roller coaster of emotions. He's on top of the world one minute, and he's fearing for his life the next minute. He's in desperation mode. Now, you think you've had a few bad years since COVID, but nothing compared to what he was going through. Six attempts on his life later, David finally realizes, hey, King Saul hates me and wants me dead. So he's got a bounty on his head and a posse on his tail, and he kisses his wife goodbye, and he takes off. Don't sound like things are going very good for David. But where can he go? Everybody knows him. My wife told me when she married me, she said, everybody knows you. Everywhere, you go, everywhere we go, there's not somebody that don't say something. Everybody knows you. Whether it's good or bad, somebody knows you. And, and some of you are like that, you know. I mean, I'm sure people know Tim and, 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 and uh, Gary and uh, Roger from his prison days. And I mean, <laughs> but anyway, but people know you. And so it would be hard to hide. So he comes up with this idea. Where would be a good place that I could go hide that I could just subtly blend in? And guess what he comes up with? I think I'll go to church. I think I'll just go to church. I ought to be able to blend in. You know what people tell us about the church? They tell us we're full of, church is full of hypocrites. We say, well, come on, one more won't hurt us, right? They come in, they can blend right in with us, right? And it's kind of funny that we say that. But David actually, he come up with this idea. He says, I'm going to go and I'm going to go to church and I'm going to just suddenly blend in and I'm going to be all right. Because ain't no, hey, all these wicked people that are chasing me, surely they're not going to come to the house of God looking for me. I mean, you think about it. We think of the church as a sanctuary. This is a place where people come to get help. It's a hospital for the sinners, amen. And hey, hey, not just the sinners, it's a hospital for the saints as well, amen. And so he says, this is going to be perfect. Now, I want to switch gears a minute. We're going to go back to David in a minute. But I want to talk about people. You know, people are desperate. People are very desperate. They slip into church and they sit on the back pew a lot of times and they hope to blend in. Sometimes you lose members of your church, especially when you're a smaller church, because they feel like if they go to a bigger church, guess what? They can hide. Nobody will notice them. Maybe they did something in the church. Maybe they didn't, like, didn't want all that responsibility, and they say, you know, I can go to a big church, and they're, you know, they got five piano players, and I can play, but I'll never play, so they're not going to call on me to play. I can just blend in. I can just come in and sit on the back row and slip out. But we see people come into church all the time, and generally they sit at the back on one side or the other. Do you know a lot of these people that come to church, they feel nervous and scared when they walk in the, in the church. Maybe they've not been in church in a while. Sometimes it's sinners, but you know what? Sometimes it's just those, those saints that need to be recovered. And they walk in and they sit down and they're sitting there and they're probably wondering, uh, you know, what people are thinking about them. They're, they're wondering when people shake their hand and they don't make eye contact if they're judging them. Maybe a woman walks in here and she's, she's single and she's been married three times and she's pregnant and she's just waiting for the other shoe to drop for somebody to judge her and here's another church that she doesn't feel comfortable in. And then there's another man and he's sitting on the other side of the church and maybe he's here after being out all night doing something that he promised God he would never do again after he got saved, but he finds himself back out in the world doing the exact same thing and he comes in and they're probably sitting on the back of the church pews thinking to themselves, what are these Christians thinking about me? So they come into the church and, and, and they're, they, they're sitting there and they're fighting a battle on the church pews, whether they're lost or whether they're saved. 
And they're probably thinking, if these people or if that preacher only knew what I've been doing all week, they probably wouldn't even welcome me in the doors. So there's a battle raging on them. They're desperate. Maybe it's an addict. We've dealt with that here at the church before many a times. Maybe it's a thief. Maybe it's a wife, uh, 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 excuse me, a child beater or a wife cheater. It can be any of those kind of things. But people just show up and they're looking for something. A lot of them are showing up. They're desperate. Many people find themselves in church hopeless and helpless. How's the church going to react to them? What will they find when they come to our church? What will they find if they go to the church down the road? What's going to be the difference in the two as they try to make their minds up on where they want to go? Is there going to be rejection in the church or is there going to be acceptance? Is there going to be compassion or is there going to be criticism? Is there going to be a turned head or an extended hand out to shake their hand or hug their neck? What are they going to find in the church? Just as David wondered what he would find in the church when he went, so does the lost, backslidden, carnal Christian, unsaved person. They're looking for something more than they have when they walked in. David didn't have anything when he walked in. David had the clothes on his back. Now, we're going to get into the story here of David just a little bit. And I want you to go back and I want you to look at verse number 1. David finds himself seeking shelter in Nob. Now, let me tell you something about the city of Nob. Nob is known as the city of priests. They have 85 priests there. So it's a, it's a very religious city. It's a small city, and this particular city is not used to war or, or weapons and all this kind of thing. It's a peaceful city, if you will, kind of like faith, right? If you think of faith in North Carolina, it's just a peaceful, quiet blink when you go through and you're out of it, right? And, and, or if you want to think a little bit bigger, you think of Charleston, South Carolina, where everywhere you look there's a steeple. I mean, it's the, it is the city of, of, of steeples, if you will. And so uh, David, he, he finds himself seeking shelter. And he walks in the church and he's confronted. He meets the preacher. And we're just going to say they call him the preacher. His name is Ahimelech. All right? And he happens to be the grandson of Eli. And that that's has some importance. We'll talk about that in a minute. David needs a hiding place from his enemy. You know why a lot of people come to church sometimes? Because the enemy's after them. You know, there's a lot of people in church today that have souls in their life, and souls chasing them. There's a lot of people, though, that have the devil on their back, and the devil has been on them, and they just need some relief. There's people out here that are going through divorce, and they're going through financial situations, and, and, and spiritual situations, and they're going through uh, uh, their children rebelling, and drugs, alcohol, this, that, whatever, politics, everything, and they're just looking for some relief. You get to a point in your life where you get tired. Even as a preacher, sometimes I just feel like, I feel like the weight of the world. I told my wife the other day, I said, sometimes I feel like I just can't breathe. I just, and, 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 and sometimes it's so, it's so nice to walk in the church when nobody's here. Because I'm able to come in and I just walk in and I lock that door. And before I get started, I just look up and I thank God for everything that He is to me and what He's done for me. And, 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 and I can just let it go. And then I can say, Lord, this is my petitions. Lord, this is going on and this is happening with her and him and this and that. And I, all of a sudden, I feel like the weight of the world is lifted off my shoulders when I walk in the door. And I feel like I can breathe. People are looking for something today. And so people are desperate as David was. And so David, he, he goes up to the preacher and he starts talking to him. And the preacher, Ahimelech, is shaken by what David has to say. In verse number 1, the Bible says, David to Nob, to Ahimelech the priest. Uh, what does it say? The preacher here was afraid at the meeting of David and said unto him, Who are, uh, Why art thou alone and no man with thee? Well, you know what that tells me? The preacher knew who David was. He knew who he was. He knew it was the king in waiting. He says, why are you traveling alone? Why do you not have people with you and all that? He knew something was up and he was troubled. And so what does David do here? So David, to reassure the priest here of his intention, you know what he does? He sins. He tells a big, fat, whopping lie. I mean, this is David. This is the man after God's own heart. This is the future king. I mean, this is, this is David who pours his heart and soul into the book of Psalm. And all of a sudden, here's David who is nothing but a liar. 
People are quick to judge people, aren't they? Every one of us are human and every one of us has a sinful nature. And we can go and, boy, you ne- I'd never compare myself to David. Oh, what a great man David was. What a warrior he was. What a king he was. What a Christian he was. I mean, he's a man after God's own heart. I could never compare. But yet David sins just like I do. David sinned and he lied and he told a big one here. And look at, look at verse number 2. The Bible says that David said unto Himelech the priest, The king hath commanded me a business, and hath said unto me, Let no man know anything of the business where, whereabout I send thee, and all I have commanded thee, and I have appointed my servants to such and such a place. Now therefore, which is under thine hand, give me five loaves of bread in my hand, or what there is present. What David said? David said, listen, he goes, How many people remember getting smart? Y'all remember that? Y'all remember how he used to walk through the doors and they just kept closing behind him? Or James Bond? David was like, man, I'm on this secret business, man. I'm like Bond. I'm 007. I mean, all this, and this is just between me and the king. Nobody can know. I mean, if I tell you, I'm going to have to kill you. You know how we always see that on shows and all that. I mean, he's just, man, he's making it up as he goes. And I imagine that Ahimelech sitting there is like, really? The king sent you on this? And the king's, and he's probably wondering, man, what is this mission? And all that. And David's just lying his hind end off right there in the house of God. You think he'd have more respect than that. You think other people that come into the house of God in 22 would have more respect than what they have for the house of God. And so, to reassure the priest, David decides to tell a whopper. And so, let's look at the reaction here. So he tells a lie. This stellar, spotless, clean king in waiting. This is, this is the future. This is the future. This is the man in waiting. I mean, this is, I mean, he's it. And he resorts to lying. When I read this, and I've read this before, and boy, it's interesting, all the different things that David finds himself in. But here's the first thing I thought of. This man is telling a lie to try to do what? Save himself. But yet, not too long ago in his past, he stood up before a giant by himself and said, I'm putting God first. God will fight my battle. You know what it shows me? It shows me all of a sudden that a Christian can all of a sudden get a little weary in their faith, a little weary in well-doing. And they can all of a sudden get a little bit, uh, you know, they can, they can find themselves slipping. And so this full of faith man all of a sudden doesn't have a whole lot of faith because he's, he's asking for things. And he's lying trying to get them on top of it. And so this young man who stayed calm when his brothers, all, remember how many brothers did he have? He had seven brothers. And all of them were out on the battlefield. And every one of them were afraid. And these are guys that probably thumped him in the head and smacked him around. You know how he got the little brother treatment, all that kind of stuff. And I'm sure a couple of them older brothers were big, brave, strong, you know, and everything. But all of a sudden, you can just see them over sucking their thumb. There's Goliath. And you're like, oh my gosh, we're going to die. And here comes David. Same David. But now he's lying. The one who stood strong before a giant and then turned around and the one who kept his cool when the king didn't. This is the same David. It's amazing. Saul hadn't sent him on no mission. We know that. He's not on royal business. You know what he is? He's a fugitive. He's an outlaw. And he lies about it all. So, uh, Ahimelech, here's the thing, he doesn't even question him. He just basically takes him at his word. I really believe deep down in my heart that Ahimelech knew something was up. Because David would never really travel alone. There was something going on. And I'm sure, because you know why? It said he was afraid in verse number one. So he knew something. Can I tell you something that everybody that comes in this church that asks us for help and tells me a sad story that we help? Do you think that I believe every single person that walks in this church? Absolutely not. But you know what? Sometimes you just got to show some compassion. And you're hoping that with that compassion that it might change something. And so he probably felt like, hey, I got it over on him. He never questioned me or anything. And so here's David. Now, spotless, squeaky clean David. Now all of a sudden, not only is he lying, but he's kind of manipulating too. So his sin is doing what? It's kind of snowballing. Can I tell you something? Your sin will snowball. 
Your little white lie will turn into a gray lie that'll turn into a black lie that'll turn into a bunch of lies. And before you know it, uh, you'll tell lies and you'll believe your own lies. And that's exactly what seems like is going on here. So then, the problem that Ahimelech had was, was guess what? He didn't have any resources. He didn't have no marita bread. He didn't have no uh, uh, ballpark buns over there on the shelf. Billy, he didn't have none of all them cakes and stuff you got over there in your store. He didn't have none of that stuff. He had no resources really to help him. But then, it's interesting, look what happens here. He had holy bread though, didn't he? David knew that was holy bread. And so, uh, he, he, it, this is not your common edible bread for somebody that just walks in the back of the church. This bread was reserved for who? The priest. All right? Now, there was a stipulation. David says, give me the bread. And the priest says, now, he's got all this going through his mind. Should I help him? Shouldn't I help him? Kind of like we do in the church. Should I help him? I kind of know something's going on, but, you know. And so, the priest says this. He says, okay. He says, this is holy bread. He says, now, for you to take, but partake of the holy bread, you should not have contact with what? Women. David says this. Here he goes and lies again. He says, well, none of us, he's talking about us, he throws everybody in the pot here. None of us have had any, we've not touched a woman, much less looked at a woman in three days. And we know that's a lie. But his lies just keep going. Because he said, hey, you know what? That's what people do, buddy. If they think they got you, they think they get you a hook, they're going to go line and sinker. They're just going to keep on. And so David felt like he had him on the hook here. And so Ahimelech, he's not sure what to do, so he tells David. He says, listen, these are the stipulations. And then David said, no, sir, innocent. Liar, liar, pants on fire. He's lying. And David, in verse number 5, he says, David answered the priest and said, of a truth women have been kept from us about these three days since I came out, and the vessels of the young men are holy, and the bread is in a manner common, yea, though it were sanctified the day in the... In the, um, in the vessel. You know what he's doing here? He's manipulating and twisting Scripture. That's exactly what he's doing here. You get somebody in the church that wants some help, and you help them, and you know what they'll say? They'll quote Romans 8, 28. All things work together for good for those that love the Lord and called according to His purpose. You get somebody in the church and you don't help them, and they'll run out of here, and I promise you they'll find a Scripture that tells us that what? We're supposed to love our neighbor as ourself. They're going to twist the Scripture to satisfy whatever emotion, whatever they can get or they don't get. And so that's what David's doing here. He is trying to sell himself and his own lies. It is okay to take the holy bread. And so, guess what? That's not enough. After he eats the holy bread, then what does he do? He turns around and he lies again in verse number 8. David said unto Himelech, is there not here under thine hand spear or sword? For I have neither brought my uh, uh, spear or sword, or, 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 or sword nor my weapons, because what? The king's business required what? Haste. You know what he said? He's like, have you ever, you know, I've been out to eat with people before, they, and I, people seem to used to do this a lot of times. But you get out and you go to meet them, and all of a sudden you get ready to get up, and it's time to pay, and they bring the checks, and I, I forgot my wallet. Oh, my goodness. I forgot my wallet. I'm like, well, you better get washing dishes. I ain't got enough. No, I don't say that. But, but uh, you know, you're like, no, let me do this for you. I'll help you or whatever, right? And, and so what he's saying is basically what we all do. He said, listen, I was in such a hurry that I forgot my stuff. Now, we know better than that. He's the future king. A future king should be traveling with what? Obviously with his weapons, uh, a, a way to protect himself, especially if he's alone. And so all of a sudden, David says, listen, I was in such a hurry, you know. It's sad. I want to tell you all something. I don't know why I just thought of this, but in my truck out here, there is a thing, and it kind of threw me off when I first seen it, or learned all these gadgets on it. But um, I got ready to get out the first day, and all of a sudden, this thing started going ding, ding, ding. It's making all this noise. I was like, what in the world? And I'm looking all around and everything, and it was saying something, and I saw the word seat. And I thought, why is it? And then I read it. It said, don't forget to look in your back seat. It's to remind you if you've got children when you get out of the truck. I kid you not, I'll take you out there and show it to you. I promise you, I'm not pulling a David on you. I'm not lying to you. My wife will tell you, it tells you and it dings every time to check your back seat. Now, now, now listen, you, you think of that, you know, don't forget. So there was a reminder there. But listen, 
Nobody had to tell me when I raised my daughter from the time she was born all the way up as a single father that I had to check my back seat. I knew where she was everywhere. I, I promise you I never had to check. I knew exactly where she was at all times. And, and it kind of reminds me of, of the scripture here when it says that he says, look, I, I got in such a hurry and the king's business was so important, I just had to run out and I forgot everything. Yeah, right. Okay? Big, another fat whopper. Now I want you to think about something. Just a few years ago, here's David asking for, he, he needs a sword. He needs some protection. But just a few years ago, a slingshot and a few rocks would have done it. His faith would have done it. This is a man that's scared. I want to tell you something. You can get back out here in the world as a Christian, and you can wallow around in the muck and the mire and the filth and all the slop and all that kind of stuff, but I'm going to tell you something. There's a day coming that you are going to need God's hand of protection more than you know. And guess what it's going to be? It's going to be when you're out there. Because when you're out there having all that fun and you think everything's going good, that's when you need God's hand of protection. Our kids today need God's hand of protection when they get on a school bus or they go into school. I mean, you never know when somebody's going to open fire. There was, a, there was one in Missouri the other day. What, three, three people were killed at a high school. You never know. And so we need God's hand of protection. But here's the thing. David had had it in his life. David had experience. And here he is begging for protection. He goes to the house of God not to ask God for protection, but he asks the priest for something tangible in case somebody comes after him. That don't sound much to me like a man of faith, especially one that just took the head off the, the mo most ferocious person uh, as far as, you know, uh, as, far as a, uh, a fighter or soldier, if you will. He had just won that battle for David. So let me tell you something. David, just like people that are backslidden and carnal, you know what he's done? He's lost his focus. But the focus that he lost was his God focus. We got a lot of people in church that's lost their God focus. That's why it don't bother people anymore whether they come to church or not. They don't feel any guilt. They don't feel any conviction. They don't feel any remorse because they have lost their focus. They, they will go out and do what they want when they want to, and they will justify it, whether it's taking on extra work, whether it's doing what this, that, whatever. And you know what? They just, they, they've lost their focus. And desperation will eventually set in. So now, what is the focus in front of us as people? You know what we focus on a lot? We focus on our problems. Our problems is our giant. Our problems. Our problems is our Goliath. Our problems is, is, is the lion in the, in, in, in the den. Our problems is, is the fiery fire. Everything in front of us is our problem. But the thing is, we focus on the problem, but we don't focus on the solution. And the solution is God. And if God has showed up before in your life and done something for you, bless God, why are, we, why are we losing our focus? How hard is it to know, hey, God brought me through this. God was good to me. God cured me. God cured my family. God put us back together. God did this. God did. But yet every time something comes along, we just break into pieces and we focus on what's right in front of us. But you know what? You're in good company because David did the same thing. And I want to tell you something today. I've often found that desperate people, they go to church. David needed something from the church. But he didn't realize when he walked in exactly what. But he needed bread and he needed protection. I want you to think about that just a minute. Keep that in your mind. David needed a sword. He got it. Now, you know what was interesting about the sword? Whose sword was it? Goliath. He goes in. He's going to use the same sword that Goliath was going to use to chop him into pieces, and that's the one he's going to go out to battle in the world with. He totally forgets God. Now he's saying, well, let me ask you a question. How, and I thought about this when I was studying. How did that work out for Goliath with that sword? Didn't work out very good, did it? He's got an O and one record with that sword. I'd have left that sucker hanging right there. So, but he walks in. And he's empty-handed. And he lies. And he manipulates. And he does all that. But yet, you know what he walks out of the house of God with? He walks out with bread, a full stomach, and he walks out with a sword, protection. I want you to think about that in our lives today. Church, the sanctuary, listen, where we gather together. 
Listen, when I come to church, you know what I'm looking for? I'm looking for some bread. Amen? I'm looking for the manna. I'm looking for God's Word. That's where I get my spiritual nourishment. That's where God fills me up. See, we're going to turn this whole script around now. And we're going to, we're going to show you something here. Because we can, we can, I can sell you this story tonight and say, look what David did and David failed and David should have trusted God. But let's just turn it around. He was in the right place, wasn't he? Sure he was. He went to the church. And to those who have a hunger for the Word of God and spiritual nourishment, what does the church satisfies it? God's Word will satisfy it. To the one on the run, the person that comes into church that seems like they're helpless and hopeless and they sit in here and, and they feel like they don't have a friend in the world, and then all of a sudden you start preaching and you tell them of John 3.16 and you tell them about Jesus and the woman at the well and you tell them about Jesus raising Lazarus and you go on and you on and on and on and on and you tell all these stories about Jesus and His interaction with all these people including Peter who denied Him, including Judas who betrayed Him and He still loved them. These same people that come to church helpless and hopeless, you know what? They can walk out of these doors knowing that there's a man named Jesus that loves them. So we come to church and we get our bread, but we also get our protection. Every single one of you that walk out of here tonight, you may have insurance on your car and that's great, but that insurance does not stop anybody from hitting and killing you when you pull out of here. You better understand that. And every time you pull out of this parking lot and you drive home at night on a dark road, you never know when a deer is going to run out. You never know when a, a tire is going to go flat. Sherry had two uh, nails in her tire, uh, was it the day before yesterday or whatever, and all of a sudden realized or whatever, but you never know when something is going to go wrong. And you know what? You may not be prepared for it, but God's prepared for everything. God sees everything that's ahead of us. So when I come to church... Not only do I want to get filled, I want my belly filled, but also, you know what? I know that I've got a God that sits on the throne. I know He's never taken off guard on anything that goes on down here. He's, he's never worried about anything, and He will protect me. I know that. You say, well, if that's the case, preacher, how come people die and all of that? It's their time. That's when God chooses to bring them home. That's a promotion for them, for those that are saved. But I know that I can trust God tonight in any situation. I know I can put Him first. I know that I... I know that I know that I know that He loves me and He's going to fight for me and He's going to do everything for my benefit. And I might not even realize it. That's the God I serve. So, He's got food and He's got armor for the battle. Folks, today, we sit here in this church today and we have got both of those in the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to tell you something. Do we always succeed in, in giving people bread and security when they come to the church? Not always. And you say, well, what do you mean by that? Well, can I tell you something I've learned? Helping people, helping people can be an ugly, ugly business. It can. I was telling, um, I was telling some folks, and my wife knew, I kind of was so disappointed with this, but the other day, um, my integrity got called into question because I tried to help somebody and they turned around and because they wanted the drugs more than they wanted God, they tried to say, well, what does he know? He, he doesn't really work at Capstone. He's not a counselor. He's never been in law enforcement. I mean, just making up these crazy stuff. I mean, stuff that can be verified in just a phone call or whatever. But all of that stuff was said. And you know what? That's the ugly part of helping people. People will love you to death when they can get everything from you. People will love you to death and they will put you on a pedestal and they'll do all these things when you help them in their time of need. But when the help stops or when they realize that they can't keep the facade up and they're not truly in it to, to, to love God and to seek God's face and all of that and they find themselves back exactly where they started, you know what they want to do? They want to blame everybody else for their problem except for the problem which is them. That's exactly how it goes. So that's the ugly part of helping people. But can I tell you something else? It's ugly. Because most of the people that we help, they have ugly lives. Ugly lives. You don't know what people's been through. I sit every Monday and listen to stories that are just ungodly. Just Some of them will make you sick of what some of these ladies have been through and what they've done to get drugs and all of this kind of stuff. You don't know what a person's been through when they walk in here and ask for money. 
And again, if we can help one out of a hundred and that one accepts Christ as Savior and gets their ticket punched to heaven and their life gets changed, is it worth it? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because let me ask you this. If you were one out of a hundred that got saved and the rapture happened tonight after the church, would it be worth it? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, people have ugly lives. I've watched people come in here, fugitives, if you will. I'm not saying that they're on the FBI's most wanted list. I'm saying people that are running from something. And if we're all honest, everybody in this church has ran from something. Sherry says she tried to run from our wedding day, but she didn't get far. <laughs> well, you better watch it, woman. I'm watching you. <laughs> Listen, folks, let me tell you something. Every one of us in here has made bad decisions, and every one of us in here has had a soul in our life. We've had somebody that we've had to look over our shoulder. And it's not necessarily just somebody. Maybe it's a circumstance or a situation or something, but we've all been there. David, in this story, is a Christian. David represents all of us sitting here in this sanctuary tonight. If David can fall and fail, are you much greater than him? You can fall and fail. But the thing about David was, even in the midst of his lying and manipulating and everything, of all places that he went to find shelter and sanctuary, he winds up in church. That's the kind of people that we have coming into church here. I'm thankful for this church. I'm thankful that we don't have the, uh, we don't have the, the cliche of, you know, turning people away at the door. Or, uh, Brother Mark Martinez told me um, that he went up to... I don't know, I think it was New Hampshire or somewhere, and, uh, and it, they drove up there to try to raise some money or uh, get, you know, see if somebody would take him on as a missionary. And so he got up there, drove all the way up there to that church, and he said they wouldn't let him speak, and they didn't even offer him gas money to get back. They didn't give him an offering or do anything. Now, I, that don't have a whole lot to do with the message, so to speak, except for this. I'm thankful when people come to our church, whether it's, a missionary or whether it's somebody, you know, we're not a big church, but out of the goodness in, of our hearts and, and, and the love in our hearts, we try to help people because that's what the church does. We, we have to be different. Can we help everybody? No. Maybe not financially or we may, can't put them in a hotel every time. I mean, we've done things like that, but we may not can get, you know, do that with everybody. But one thing we can do for them, we can sure can pray for them. We can hug their neck. We can try to get them in touch with somebody that can help them. And let me tell you something. The help comes from the Lord. Before we sit here and try to send them to some program out here or whatever, we need to point them to Jesus first. And so tonight, listen, many times as a pastor, I'm, I, I have been forced to choose between black and white, but sometimes also shades of gray. And sometimes not necessarily between right and wrong, but degrees of both. Sometimes you have to look at things and you have to be neutral on things. And so when I studied my Bible as a, as, as a saved person, not even as a pastor, just as a saved person, I countlessly read the times that Jesus had compassion on people. And as I get older, I feel like I'm getting more compassionate. Because when I started off, Tim, I'll be honest with you, I mean, People come to church and they'd ask for money, and man, I, I mean, man, I wanted, I wanted hair samples and DNA and you know all this kind of stuff. And we've, we've kind of, and, and some of you know, I mean, because you just get tired. You can read people, but even reading people, understanding that the same person that we were, they're, they're in the same sin that we were in, and, and so it, it should help us to be more compassionate to people when they come in the church. I'm not saying that. Listen, we're going to put an ATM out front and the pin number up in lights on the board. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying we ought to have compassion. Now here's, here's what's interesting. Nearly a millennium has passed since David found himself in the church. And David pulled this stunt and all of that. But the very son of David, who is that? That's Jesus Christ. All right? He, find, he talks about something. I want you to turn real fast. I'm going to let you go here. I want you to turn to Matthew chapter number 12 real fast. Matthew chapter number 12, and I want to give you something that the Lord says here. Matthew 12, look at verse number 1. Matthew 12, 1. 
At that time, Jesus went on the Sabbath day through the corn, and his disciples were hungered and began to pluck the ears of corn and to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto him, Behold, thy disciples do that which is not lawful to do upon the Sabbath day. But he said unto them, Have you not read what David did when he was unhungered? And they that were with him. Uh-oh, how about that? How he entered into the house of God and did eat the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, neither for them which were with him, but only for the priest? Or have you not read in the law how that on the Sabbath day the priest in the temple profaned the Sabbath and are blameless? But I say unto you that in this place is one greater than the temple. How about that? Everything David did, but yet Jesus used him as an example a millennium later. Ain't that something? That gave me chills when I read that. That is, that is just, that, that, that's our Lord and Savior right there. So the question needs to be asked tonight, how many Davids were fed and equipped in the church tonight? This past Sunday. How many Davids will be fed and equipped this coming Sunday? You know, one thing we can learn from Ahimelech is he teaches to pursue the spirit of the law more than the letter of the law. You understand what that means? The law says render, or, you know, the commandments say render under Caesar what Caesar and to God what is God's, right? All right, so that's what, that's what the law says, okay? Um, now, today, if somebody come in here and they said to you, they said, listen, if you're a Christian and you believe that Caesar, Joe Biden, Caesar Augustus, our Joe, modern day Joe Biden says he wants everybody in this church today to give $1,000 right here on the spot because he is about to, uh, they're about to revamp this thing on abortion and they're about to make it the law of the land and you have got to give your $1,000 uh, to Joe Biden because that's what the law says. say, I'm not giving you a penny, right? I'm not giving you a penny. You know why? Because I don't agree with that and that is not right. And so sometimes, you know what? Even, you know, we, in law enforcement, we always said this, and I've said this many times over the years, ignorance of the law is no excuse. I used to say that. I used to think to myself, if I was in that guy driving that car and a cop said that to me, I would probably have something smart to say. And I'm the one saying it to him. And I'm thinking how smart that is. But we would say that, right? And it sounds smart aleck and all that kind of thing. But here's the thing. If I stop Miss Jennifer and I'm running radar and Miss Jennifer's driving uh, 58 and a 35, and I stop her, and she says, listen, I say, I don't even want to hear it. Ignorance of the law is no, I didn't know it was, I don't care. You need to look at the signs, whatever, you know, and I'll be right back with you. And she's sitting there, and she's just cussing me under her breath and all this stuff, calling me all these names, you know, wishing my car would blow up, all this kind of stuff. And then I go back to the car, and she's sitting, she's crying. And I'm like, oh, don't try to pull that blonde crying thing with me. And, uh, and, 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 and everything. And then she says, well, you didn't understand. I was in a hurry because my mom was about to go into surgery and they called me and, and she might not make it through or, or my dad was in a car wreck or my, or my daughter, something was going on, my daughter, or something was going on, you know, all these things. Well, let me ask you what, is it more important that I write her a ticket and hold her up because she broke the law or I have a little bit of compassion and say, you go ahead, ma'am, I'm sorry, I didn't, and maybe even give her an escort or something. You see what I'm saying? That's what Ahimelech was saying right here. See, those things, listen, sometimes we get so caught up in, in trying to uphold the law. And so David reminds us that desperate people are still seeking help among God's people. That's why we don't judge when somebody comes in this church. Listen, if they come in here and they say, I don't care how bad they smell, we got air freshener in here. I, hey, listen, we'll open the windows up. Well, we'll do what we got to do, but I'll tell you one thing, we're not going to run them out of the house of God because they don't smell like we do or they don't look like we do. And, and so, listen, folks, I'm closing here. When David stumbled, where did he stumble into? He stumbled in the house of God where he meets, God meets and ministers to the hopeless hearts. I'm going to end right here. If you blinked and missed the, the whole moral of the message tonight, David's ongoing life story teaches that those people that are desperate need to make their way into the presence of God and His people for the real help that you can only find in your time of need. I want you to stand tonight, heads bowed and eyes closed. A little bit different take on David and the showbread. Heard it preached many different ways. Amazing what, how God can speak to us.
But I want to ask you a question. Not every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're here tonight and you're a desperate David, you're running from something, there's something going on in your life, and you're just trying to get help, you're trying to get relief, you're in the right place tonight. I believe that every single person.